let me give you briefly a, a group picture, okay? And so kind of, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Amsterdam, uh, uh, to the Rijksmuseum, that there is the, the Night Watch, you know, Rembrandt, you know, the big portrait. So imagine that all these judges are all the people standing um, on, on that portrait. So we have something like, depending on what criteria you use to determine what an international court is, you might have something between 18 to 19 currently existing and functioning international courts. Of these, only 13 are what we call consequential, that is to say they have an important caseload or they decide cases that have major impact on international relations. So if you count all the judges on those 13 courts, together you come up with a group of 215 people. Of these 215, they come from 86 different countries. I'm just giving you the data that we had in January 2006. So it's a great geographic variation. All continents are represented. Europe has the majority, 65% of them. But that's only because most courts with the highest number of judges happen to be in the European continent, and that is the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. Asia, which represents half of humanity, is underrepresented on this international bench with only 16% of the judges. But again, this is due to the fact that there are no regional courts in Asia, and therefore the numbers are distorted by that. As background, 63% come from civil law countries, I mean, countries with a civil law system, 14% from common law. So the common law element is numerically underrepresented, but when it comes to the functioning of the court, it's very important and, and very to the forefront. Gender is still very much still a male profession. 79% of them are men, 21% of them are women. Now, I started keeping track of gender issues on the international bench 10 years ago. And I must say that this figure has gone from something like 3% to 21% uh, in a decade. So there is an important trend that eventually probably in a decade or two should lead to something uh, closer um, to 50-50%. Albeit there is a great diversity in the experiences and the origins of these international judges, we noticed also that they tended to study at first in their national universities, in their home countries, but then they move on to take advanced degrees in law in two countries, United Kingdom and United States. So civil law, people trained in civil law system at a certain point had a significant opportunity to train themselves also in common law, and they tended to study within the same handful of institutions within the UK and the United States, which are the, the, the top level universities. Finally, they have a huge diversity of experience. Even right now, although there is a large number of courts and there is a large need of people to serve as judges, there is not yet a profession of the international judge. When we interviewed the judges for our books, most of them agreed on the fact that they didn't, they couldn't plan to become an international judge, but it was like the job that found them. So they basically come from three different walks of life, three professions. One is academia, which historically, provided the, the majority of international judges and still now the days is the largest group but only by a little margin over the second largest group which is national judges, judges who have been practicing at the high level, uh, at the high level judiciary, uh, of the judiciary in their home countries. And the third group are civil servants. That, that includes both uh, people who are civil servants in, for the national governments or for international organizations. So we have a broad range of diversity of experience, but these three pools of people eventually bring something unique to the profession together.